Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 355, recorded on Friday, July 13th, 2018. Jesse Meekham, founder of You Need a Budget. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Hello, welcome to another episode of Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell sitting in the hot seat. I love this show because I get to talk to people who are, in many cases, they're writing amazing books. They're revealing facets about the world of technology and also many other things, as is the case today. Uh, I've been, I would say, historically throughout my life, money and finances and stuff has been a topic that had bored me, not because it was boring, but because it was kind of uh, intimidating, I suppose. I'm sure I'm not, I, you know, I'm sure my history is similar to a lot of other people. You start hearing people talk about money and finances and budgeting, and it's easy for your eyes to kind of gloss over and for you to pass on because it's kind of intimidating to think about holding that power for yourself. A um, couple of years ago, through a, f a few different circumstances, my wife and I discovered an online system called YNAP, which stands for You Need a Budget. And it took a little bit of time for us to really understand the mentality, understand the approach, really commit ourselves to the system. But I can safely say, looking backwards, that YNAB changed my, my outlook on money, period, hands down. Um, we, you know, I, I can speak for myself anyways, I'm not scared of thinking about uh, how to manage my finances. And in fact, I feel very empowered by it now. And I absolutely point to YNAB as the tool that kind of woke me up, so to speak. Uh, so I am super thrilled to welcome to the show uh, Jesse Meekum. He's the uh, the founder and creator of YNAB, You Need a Budget, also the author of a book that came out about, I don't know, four or five months ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, You Need a Budget, The Proven System for Breaking the paycheck to paycheck cycle, getting out of debt and living the life that you want. Jesse, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, man. It's it's my it's 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 my honor, honestly. And I have to imagine, I mean, you've created a tool and and this has been around for long enough that you've probably talked to a whole lot of people, a whole lot of the users of this software uh, to kind of hear similar stories of, of what I kind of le led with, right? People were afraid of money. They were afraid of, of what it takes to kind of hold this power over their finances. And then they, you know, discover something like YNAB and that changes things. Is that pretty familiar to you? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully my, my work entails, uh, you know, working with great people. And then, uh, I, I sometimes forget because you get mixed up in the business of things, but it, it really does help people, you know, change their finances. Uh, a lot of times improve relationships yeah. and, uh, it's pretty fulfilling at the end of the day to, to know that this is feeding the, you know, feeding my family and doing some good in the world I hope. So uh, it doesn't really get old. I'll be honest. That's awesome. Um, and I mean, it really shows the, the way that, uh, the way that you carry yourself, like in the blog and everything, you're communicating a lot with the users through the blog on the wine app page, which I highly recommend is a lot of really great tips and, and tricks and kind of philosophy, you know, molding around how you can think about money and utilize the tools that YNAB gives you. But a lot of these, you know, some, some of them you're writing, some of them other employees of YNAB are writing, but there's a lot of personality in there. And I think when you're talking about budgeting and money, it's very easy to think of it as a very dry topic. But yeah. that personality and that energy is really important in hopefully, you know, pulling people into this new idea, this new philosophy. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, you know, when you say the company name, you need a budget, people are, you know, they're kind of like, ha, 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 you know, they're like nervous laughter, like budget's not the friendliest word at, at the outset. So we have a little bit of an uphill climb, but what we, people normally think of prison or, or maybe severe dieting when they hear the word budget. So we yeah. are, we try and come across as pretty friendly and, 
uh, sometimes a little bit authoritative, a little bit, um, you know, tongue in cheek, kind of in your face. But at the end of the day, we want people to know, like, it's your money, you know, so you decide what you want to do with it. And we really are just trying to get people to be aware of what they really want and then aware of their money and make sure those two things line up, you know, and, and there's a whole business built around that. But the idea is just that getting people to line up their money with their real priorities and then, you know, magic happens for them. Yeah. Awareness and then empowerment, because it can yeah, feel very absolutely. helpless when you don't have a plan and you don't have an idea or any sense of control over yeah. all this stuff that happens. You know, you look at your your account and you have X amount of dollars there. But what does that X amount of dollars actually mean? What does that translate yeah. into? That can feel very nebulous and uh, and obviously a system like this or any budgeting system, to, to oh, yeah. be honest. Yeah helps kind of pull someone out of that. Absolutely. And I tried in the book, I was really afraid when we were first setting out to write it. Um, I was afraid that people would say, oh, that's just going to sell the software. But we really tried hard in the book to make sure that people understood we're teaching you principles. And then you can take those principles and you can grab some ledger paper if they still make that. I think they do. Or grab a notebook, roll your own spreadsheet, probably use a good number of our competitors software very well as long as you're implementing the rules behind it, it, it will work, you know? And, and I think we did that in the book. I think people felt like, okay, I'm, I'm getting the principles. And if we want to try, you know, Jesse's specific software, we can do that. But they also knew they weren't beholden to this one system, you know, that they could take those principles and run with them with whatever medium, you know, kind of fit. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree. It seems like, and I think early on in the book, you actually mentioned that, that the, yeah. you know, this is, this book is not written to necessarily sell your software. It's a nice added bonus. And to be completely is, yeah. honest, as a user, the software is, you know, it's way easier for me to use the software and, and, and throw myself into it and learn that process than it would be for me to build things up. I am horrible when it comes to spreadsheets. And yeah. <laughs> my, my wife and I, prior to YNAB, we, we were budgeting for a number Number of years, but it was all in a single Excel spreadsheet. It was yeah. way less, you know, structured than what I what I do now with our uh, YNAB budget. And I never left our budgeting kind of talks feeling especially good or cheery. <laughs> you know, the outlook yeah. it still was kind of drab. A, you're inside of a spreadsheet, and B, I just don't think we were doing it effectively enough. It's it's actually a very complicated thing. Yeah, it is. There's there's some principles there that if we capture those, people do pretty well. But it's it's intimidating, you know. Yeah. And and I try and tell people um, go slow and give yourself lots of room to make mistakes, and then just start again, you know. Mm -hmm. And as we, I, I've just recently taken up woodworking, so I'm I'm enthralled by the most mundane of tasks. You know, I just feel like any one of those tasks, if it if an edge is straight on a board I just cut, I just think this is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then as I've done one little table, I look at it and I think, well, that doesn't look good at all. You know, and then I did another little project, a little bench, and I think, well, that that actually there are some spots I don't like, but I've made some improvements, and it's been fun to be a complete novice, but it's it's hard to give yourself permission to make those mistakes, especially when it appears to be so high stakes. You know, money inherently has this emotion attached to it that's very high stakes. So I just want anyone that's listening to know, get started and just kind of realize, ah, oh, for three, four, five months, I'm going to be kind of feeling things out and learning as I go. It's a great mindset to be in. And I was I was actually just talking with another one of the hosts here, Megan Maroney, about this prior to the interview. She's uh, she's very used to hearing me say how excited I, I have been about this interview. Uh, but, you know, we were kind of talking about exactly that, right? Like when, you, when I first started and my wife and I first sat down and started with this budget, I mean, we didn't understand everything about the system on day one. It really yeah. took a half a year, if not, you know, two thirds of a year before I could then look backwards and go, man, I really understand it way better than I did on day one. And those first few yeah. months, while they were interesting, we knew there was something there. We still had to have a leap of faith to really understand that in the, you know, it, down the line, we would really understand the mentality and the philosophy behind behind the system. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, that's happened to the point to where now, let's say around two and a half, almost three years later, I could yeah. not imagine doing it any other way. It's just been yeah. that effective for me. Um, we're talking kind of around it. And obviously, you know, people who have never heard of YNAB before, 
understand that it's a budgeting tool, but maybe give us a brief ex explanation uh, in your own words as far as what it has become as a, as a piece of software, but also okay. a philosophy at this point. Yeah, so it started out as, uh, I mean, I don't know if you want me to go this far back, but it started out as a spreadsheet. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, I learned how to build them in college, you know, and I learned, oh, this system's pretty useful, you know, this piece of software. And so my wife and I, we married early. And uh, I say early, I think we were 21, 22. So we were young and we were both in school and broke. And I knew we would have to watch our finances very, very closely. So I built a little spreadsheet just for me and Julie and had no intention of ever you know, marketing it. But then, um, we, we got pregnant fairly quickly after we got married and this new baby's coming along. And one of mine and Julie's big things that we had talked about, even before we got married was when we do have a, a child, Julie wanted to be able to be full time, you know, at home with the baby. And she was the breadwinner at the time I was still in school. So that was where I thought, well, maybe the spreadsheet that's been working well for us, maybe it could work well for other people. So I put that out there online and this was back in 2004 before so many things <laughs> that we now take right. for granted before apps, you know, before the phone exploded onto the scene and, and all of that. So I put out this spreadsheet and it just slowly started selling just, you know, one off. I can remember the email address of the first person that bought the spreadsheet. You know, it was <laughs> like it was a big deal. So it, it just really slowly iterated. But quickly I, I recognized, oh, OK, spreadsheets have limitations. And so we. um I, I contracted with who, uh, a guy that's now my CTO, and he built a, a standalone piece of desktop software at the time, and uh, we launched with that. And then as time's gone on, we've gone to multiple versions. They've been cross-platform, and now it's a web app. When the phones came on the scene, we now have you know the iOS and Android complements to that. They're actually, um, as far as usage goes, far more important, I think, on the go to be staying in touch with your money on your phone. Absolutely. And um, just recently we, we rolled out an API to allow other people to kind of build on top of YNAB and do all sorts of very crazy things that we would likely never develop on our own, but it's been, been fun to watch. So we have a little bit of an ecosystem as far as the tech goes around um, helping people just take the, we, you know, we want to take the tedium as much as possible out of the process while not creating a situation where they become less aware of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, mobile is obviously such a, a huge component of our lives nowadays, of our techn technological lives, but also just our lives in general. So many things loop through this little computer that we carry around in our pocket. And it never really occurred to me how powerful that could be when applied to something like a budget. But, you know, huh. a big part of the YNAB philosophy is that you're only spending the, you know, the money that you've set aside, given it a job, as you put it. Right. Um, um, and so it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where, hey, you know, we, wow, we're really tired. It's the end of the day. The last thing I want to do is, is go into the kitchen and, and make some food. My wife agrees. You can open up the phone in your, in your pocket, even when you're out of the house and go, oh, well, hey, dining out category has $50 in it. What do you know? We have the money to eat out yeah. and we can afford to do this. And also just kind of managing it as you go. Like we just got back from a, a road trip and while we're driving on the way home, my wife's going through on all the expenses and routing them into the vacation category, you know, that, that we had set aside, the money that we had set aside for vacation. So that saves us from having to sit down specifically to do that stuff on a Saturday yeah. morning together. We still sit down and do that, but we can focus on different things as opposed to categorizing transactions or right. something like that. You just do it on the go. It takes five minutes and you're done. You can move on. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've, we've got a little, I mean, it's a few years now, but we, we added a little feature a while ago where we would pick up where you are, you know, so if I'm uh, at, you know, the d hardware store or something and I go to add a transaction, YNAB kind of says, oh, Jesse's at the hardware store again. We've seen a transaction like this before. It's probably for his new woodworking hobby and it just kind of pre-populates everything. And so I really am just left to enter the amount, you know, you add yeah. transaction, you enter the amount and then you're done. So we've tried again it, that you, there is no value in having someone manually do a lot of work. The value is in what you described where you say, hey, we'd like to eat out. You right. know, is there enough in the dining category? Yes, there is. OK, let's do it. That that's beauty. That's exactly how we want it. You know, yeah. um, where you're it's in context. It's given you it's given you the information you need in the moment you need it and nothing else. We don't want to sit there in our, our faces and our budgets all day long, but we also don't want to know how much we can spend uh, to restore the, you know, maybe do a bathroom renovation when we're wanting to eat out. And what happens is people will just look at their checking account balance and then say, oh, well, can we do this? 
and that's that's kind of the worst that you know worst thing they can possibly do as far as quality of information that they're getting to help them with that decision. Yeah, looking into your account and seeing that there's money there, therefore we must be able to afford this thing, but you don't actually yeah. really truly know, you know? Um, don't know. I, yeah. I, I just got a, a notification, a calendar reminder on my phone that says, you know, our car registration is uh, is coming up tomorrow. And, you, you know, this is it's one of those moments where I'm like, oh, you know what? A year ago, we included an item. We knew about how much it was going to be a year later. We plopped it into YNAB. It split out the monthly kind of deposit into that bucket that would be required over the course of those. And, and when you break it down on a monthly basis, it's really not that much. And mm -hmm. so there's no stress behind it. Like I know yeah. that tomorrow when I need to pay our car registration, the money's already in there. It's not a matter of thinking, man, can I afford it? Or, you know, I see money in the account, so we must be able to afford it. <laughs> it's knowing that that money has been set aside, it's been given that job. Yeah, absolutely. That pile of money is both a, a blessing and a curse. When there's a big pile, people <laughs> yes. just say, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? And then the pile's gone. And then they have an actual obligation come in two days later. And they're yeah. thinking, well, why can't we ever get ahead? Why do we have to put stuff on cards? It's that reason. It's not that people are knowingly saying, you know, I'd like to run up my credit card a little bit. It's, it's usually just the fact that they aren't making the best decision they can. They don't have the best information to make the best decision. Um, and we're not talking about being super frugal. We're not talking about cutting a bunch of spending. We're just talking about making a decision that you would actually want to make given good information. You know, like a car registration is coming up or property taxes are due or this big life insurance premium is coming up or this road trip you went on. You know, you probably had some amount of money in there and it's for the road trip. And so you can't be standing in a department store and then just say, well, can we afford that? You you want to be able to get a little more granular and say, this pile of money, like it all has different jobs. I love when people will say, my checking account has $12,000 in it and I feel broke because then they've gotten it. They realize, yep. okay, we're, we're going to Little Caesars for a $5 pizza, no sushi, you know, we're not, we don't have any money in the dining out category, but they're sitting there with 10, 12 grand in their checking account that has all other kinds of purposes. So feeling broke and having that cash, that's where you really know things are starting to click. Absolutely. A big part of this, of course, is uh, mindset, right? And, you know, a large part of the, the book, You Need a Budget, uh, is about kind of giving people the tools they need to develop that mindset. And specifically, YNAB has a very focused mindset. We'll talk about the rules here in a little bit, in, in a few minutes. But I, I guess what I'm wondering is you obviously, you, you did a great job early on, but starting with the spreadsheet and then ultimately in creating this business and this tool in understanding some of these financial lessons and understanding how to think about it in a way that obviously works for a lot of people. I'm, I'm just kind of curious as a kid, like I never felt like education, at least in, in a formal sense, was very good around finances. Any of my education came from my parents and they did a pretty good job, probably could have done a little bit better job, but I'm educating myself now. Uh, but I, when you were a kid, did you learn about this stuff directly or indirectly? Were your parents a good kind of example in that regard? How did that work? I think um, I grew up in a very stable household. So I think that like sometimes I, I think back to my childhood where I, I knew there'd be food on the table. I, I had both parents at home. I had a mom that was home when I got home from school, like like very stable situation. As I as I look back and, you know, you, you realize you're raised one way and then you look around and you think, oh, wait, that doesn't happen to everybody, you know, but when you're a mm -hmm. kid, you just kind of accept it as real. So yeah. that stability, I think, can't be, can't be overstated really. But um, as far as specific lessons, my dad had this really interesting kind of indirect way of um, teaching me. And I remember discussions that he would have, uh, you know, the two of them would have about money, and I don't remember them being particularly peaceful um, and not tense, not not crazy. But right. I I remember seeing that they were kind of tense. But when I, I remember when I turned 14, as far as lessons go, he he gave me uh, George Clayson's book, The Richest Man in Babylon. He said, mm -hmm. "You should read this. This is good." And I read it. I liked it. I liked the topic. And then after I'd read that, he said, you should read this book. It's it's uh, called The Millionaire Next Door. A fantastic and book. And tell me what you think, you know. And and I read that. I thought, oh, I, I, everyone, if you're a millionaire, you you know, you drive an F-150. That's, that's what I've determined from this book, you know. So there were really <laughs> interesting lessons that he would just kind of passively. He gave me uh, Dave Ramsey's first book, the Financial Peace book, that was all kind of like debt is bad. Don't do debt. And that really had an impact on me when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. I thought, okay, so when I go to school, I won't borrow money for school. I'll just kind of slowly work. And, um, you know, you, you don't think of them as impactful at the time, but 
looking back, I realized I liked that topic. I liked the subject. I liked thinking about the investing, the money. And, um, and I also, um, it just resonated with me as, as far as how I wanted to live my life. So, um, I'm grateful my dad gave me those few books. He was super chill about it, not cramming down my throat, but he saw I liked one and gave me another and we just kind of went from there. Yeah. It sounds like you got, you, you then got a, a pretty great education or at least you were pointed in the right direction from your parents, which, you know, a lot of people don't even have that probably partially Absolutely. because their parents aren't aware of that or, or tuned into that stuff either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Millionaire Next Door is a fantastic book. I, I need to read The Richest Man in Babylon. I keep meaning to, and I have it on my list. Um, it's like a fable format. I've, yeah. I enjoy it because it's, I don't know, you just, it's, it's a quick, fun read and uh, not quite as dry as, as we like to write things in this industry. So. <laughs> sure, sure. Why, why do you think most people have a hard time committing to a budget? Uh, I think they're afraid that they'll have to um, just cut back on anything that brings them joy. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they see that and they're like, well, I, I want to be happy. Therefore, I, I can't budget. And, um, and so we just try and convince them. Sometimes you'll convince a reluctant spouse that way. You know, you just, you kind of just budget on your own. You set aside money for this thing. And then one day you buy it and the spouse is like, where'd we get money for this? And you say, oh, I budgeted for it. It took me several months, but I, I bought this. And no guilt attached to it. Um, paying for it with cash and uh, something that actually brings you joy where um, you don't feel bad when you buy it. It's it's a nice thing to have happen. So we just have to convince people that a budget is really just a plan for your money. It's It's a roadmap for what you want your life to be like. And money helps us create the life we want. Uh, whether we are comfortable with that thought or not, it is reality. And and so if, if you know that money is the main tool you can have to create the life you want, I'm not saying you need a lot of it, but you know that that is a key tool, then you want to create a plan for that money that gets you the life that you want. So it's really about deciding what you want, not deciding um, what you need to give up. The right. give up stuff ends up coming pretty quickly. Someone says, I want A, B, and C, and then they look that they're spending on X, Y, and Z, and they're like, well, I don't want to do that. And they suddenly are you know, cutting things. And I hesitate, even in interviews like this, I hesitate to give examples of what people cut because... <laughs> I don't want them to think, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that then. You, I want people to get to that should situation all on their own where they've done their own analysis, they've done their own deep thinking and they realize, oh, I, I should cut this out because I don't care to spend money on it, you know, instead of having a neighbor tell them, you know, what they should or shouldn't do yeah. or having an author do the same thing. Right, right. Once you've listed out all the things that are a uh, high priority to you, be it, be it practical, be it things that you have to spend your money on on a monthly basis and you know this and so you plan for it, or be it the things that are kind of like, you know, sh sh shooting to, to the moon to make it happen. Yeah. Like even something as simple as like a vacation budget, you know mm -hmm. that that brings you joy to go on vacation. Once you've got all of your your list laid out and you're truly honest with it in, in structuring that, and that takes a little bit of work, so there's a little bit of work to be done there, uh, then you start to look and you start to realize, well, if we did cut out the coffee, you know, the, the daily coffee trips. And that's a great, a great example that I think applies to a lot of people. If you oh, yeah. actually take a look at the amount of money that you're paying instead of making, you know, coffee at home, which is not that difficult. Um, mm -hmm. and you take that, that sum of money from a single month and you realize, well, you know, we could give ourselves an extra hundred dollars a month in our vacation fund. And what does that enable? What does that empower us to do instead yeah. of just having a lazy coffee every morning and paying through the teeth for it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a matter of, I've been doing interviews with people for a little while where we're, we're interviewing people that are getting out of debt. And I always ask them, well, what did you do? Where'd you cut back? Cause they end up paying a pretty uh, significant amount off over a fairly short period of time. And I said, where'd you cut? You must've cut somewhere without fail. Every single interview I've done so far, and I've probably done 20 has said, we cut back on eating out. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, don't ever say, oh, you shouldn't spend money eating out. But so far, at least in our sample of people that have paid off a lot of debt, they've just said, yeah, we realized, oh man, we'd rather have that money go elsewhere. It's not that eating out is bad. It's not that it's a waste of money. It's just that it's not the most important thing that they wanted their money to do. And maybe once things are paid off, they'll kind of loosen the belt a little bit and say, well, let's maybe go out a little more. Um, but that's, you know, that's that for them to decide. It's fascinating when we pick what we want all the other stuff starts to kind of just disappear and people don't feel like they're cutting back. They don't feel like they're being super frugal. They don't feel like they're missing out on anything. 
they just recognize that they're achieving what they want faster than they would have thought otherwise. And that's that's exactly what budgeting is. It's just trim away the stuff you don't care about and go aggressively after those things that you do. Another thing that uh, that took us a little while to really understand is this idea of you know, we were very, to a certain degree, our, our, our budgeting, you know, we, we were not complete novices before YNAB came along. We had multiple bank accounts at different banks that served different purposes. So we, you yeah. know, it was kind of like, it was kind of like the accounts were the categories within YNAB. You know, we knew that we wanted to have, you know, something dedicated to vacation or we wanted to have something dedicated to uh, my personal spending versus, you know, versus my wife's personal spending for things like clothes and everything like that. So we had different accounts. It took us a while to really understand the YNAB approach, which, I mean, I, I'm sure you can do that with multiple accounts and YNAB, the software allows you to pull in a number of accounts on an automatic yeah. basis. But you guys, you guys seem to stress this idea idea of the less accounts you have, the better. Let something like YNAB or a spreadsheet or whatever you choose to do manage the money within that large bucket, that single account yeah. where all that money is managed from uh, from within. Why is that? It's just simpler, really. There's no, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with having lots of accounts. You just end up uh, with a little more tedium than yeah. you would otherwise, and we're just trying to eliminate that. So you don't have to reconcile as many accounts. You don't have to log into as many. Uh, you don't have to check and make sure nothing fraudulent's happened on those accounts. Uh, just little maintenance things. It's not a big deal to have a few accounts, um, but we just once people get comfortable. The reason that they the reason that they put it in a separate account is because they're afraid they'll spend it. Yes, right. Absolutely. So once they are comfortable, like you know, I've been doing this with my checking account with YNAB, and I'm not spending the money. I am living off of the the balances in these categories. Now I they they kind of come to that their own conclusion and say, well, it does seem a little superfluous to have these extra extra accounts. What's really funny is the, there's the savings account revolving door that will happen. And I bet a lot of people have done this where you you say, I should save money because I heard on some show that we should save money. So you're you're saving money dutifully. Maybe it's put in, you know, directly from your paycheck or something. And you're pretty proud of that amount that you save. And then somewhere along the way, um, something happens and you think, well, I need to draw from my savings. Maybe you needed to replace a computer. Maybe you had an expensive vet bill for your pet. Who knows? But the money comes out of the savings account. And then you kind of start the whole process again. Of, oh, I should save. And so <laughs> what you're really doing is you're just setting aside for this kind of nebulous eventuality because you know eventually I will need that money. But you also at the same time feel guilty that you have to use your savings. Yes. And so it's a, it's a fascinating little thing. It's a dance people do that ends up being fairly guilt-ridden uh, and doesn't make them feel like they're making any progress. And so – when we can bring all of the money and even these piles that are in savings accounts and say, even savings needs to have a specific job. Is that for eventual vet bills? Cool. Okay. Is that for a new computer? Excellent. But make sure you name all of the jobs, even in those accounts, so that you don't feel guilty when the dollars actually just go and serve their purpose, you know, do what they were supposed to do. Absolutely. That touches on a few of the rules, which we're going to talk about. But first... Let's take a, take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode of Triangulation. Then we'll jump right into the rules, which are, are pivotal to the YNAB approach. I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, this episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Perfect uh, sponsorship for this particular episode, especially. It's all about finances. Let's talk about buying a home for a minute. Uh, you know, you know, interest rates are rising. There's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home these days. There, there always is, but uh, especially right now, it's causing a lot of people anxiety. Uh, and our friends at Quick Loans are doing something about it. They're calling it the power buying process. And here is what it's all about. Quick Loans will verify your income, your assets, and credit in less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval. This gives you the strength of a cash buyer. And if you've ever want, you know, been looking for a home or even if you've been selling a home, you know that cash is king. Cash buyers, I mean, the ca cash buyer is kind of what you're always looking for. If this gives you the strength of that, you know that you're ahead of the game. Once you're verified, you qualify for their all new exclusive rate shield approval. First, they'll lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. So that's not gonna, you know, that's not gonna change if rates go up. Your rates will stay the same. If rates go down your rate also drops. So it's it's a win-win situation for you. 
It's kind of uh, thinking uh, that you would expect from America's largest mortgage lender. And you go through the process, you get your home, you're happy as can be. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. All right. Chatting with Jesse Meekham, author of You Need a Budget, founder of YNAB, the site that I am obviously a really big fan of. Um, so critical to YNAB is kind of shifting this mindset. We talked a little bit about mindset before the break. And uh, you focus on four rules and it's totally a learning process, I know, because I've kind of gone through this whole process where, okay, I get that rule, but this one is taking me a while. And I'm finally at the point to where I've, I've embraced all four, thankfully, because it's really changed and evolved how our budget works. So let's let's kind of go through these real quick here. Um, yeah. I'll spend a little bit of time diving into them. Rule one is give every dollar a job. And this kind of ties into what we're talking about, having little envelopes uh, virtual envelopes, anyways, uh, where your money goes into. Um, is that kind of what this is all about? Do you, do you, did you ever happen to live your life with actual envelopes? <laughs> I, I didn't. I, I was a meticulous tracker, but never actually used the envelopes. I tried it for a while uh, after I'd started YNAB just out of curiosity. I yeah. thought, well, this, this, it works. It like works. The idea it's messy, zero but it works. It works. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's very tedious. And yeah. then you forget an envelope and you're supposed to go grocery shopping, stuff like that. So, um, the principle behind it, though, that it's zero based. If I spend here uh, on A, I can't spend on B as much or that those trade offs are so critical. And it's important that every dollar has a job so that every dollar is accountable. We we end up through this rule and it's a little bit nuanced, but we end up creating um, a feeling of scarcity when we're doing this properly, where when we were talking about going out to eat, if you had fifty dollars or five dollars it determines what you might do as far as eating out goes. And so you could have a lot of money sitting in your checking account, but when you look at at uh, your your envelope balance and you say, okay, dining out has 50, okay, we're not gonna go uh, you know, get steaks, but we could go somewhere quick maybe. Or, I mean, heck for us, Chick-fil-A sets us back 50 bucks, you know? So yes, right. it depends on how many mouths you're feeding too. But you're doing this analysis and you're thinking, okay, if you have five, you're going and getting a $5 pizza. The idea of scarcity is just, hey, money is scarce. And what will you do now? Because money is scarce. And that feeling that you don't have enough, um, every other marketer, it seems, every business, every bank tries to eliminate that feeling in your heart. <laughs> they try and not have you ever feel that you've run out of money. And I feel like that is a huge uh, loss for us as consumers. You want to get comfortable with the idea of having zero or close to zero because that's where you start to make very powerful, like very big decisions. But if we can just walk past zero and spend going out to eat because, well, we'll just think about it later and you never think about it again, we we never feel what it's like to run out. And it leads to us just kind of being very, um, I don't know what the word is, very casual in our thinking. And I feel like we lose some creativity. I feel like we lose a little bit of willpower and um, we don't we don't have our best selves come out that that solves problems, you know, that figures out, okay, we've run out of money here. What are we going to do about it? So that's a that's a nuanced thing about rule one, but it cannot be overstated. When you get comfortable with having things scarce, creativity starts to blossom and you really end up um, making great decisions and really making things happen for yourself. And too often we just fall into a credit card and say, oh, that'll bail me out and that'll bail me out until we, you know, we pay the piper eventually with it. So um, that rule is just, it's, it's every other rule is a derivative of, of rule one where you're giving every dollar a job. Yeah. And I have to imagine, you know, part, part of the challenge here is, is, uh, when people are, are structuring, you know, giving, giving every dollar a job means 
you know, really analyzing what your priorities are and understanding where your money does go, creating a list of that. And that ends up being, you know, all of these little pockets, these little envelopes that it goes into. There's obligations in there that have to happen uh, yeah. versus habits. And you point out that's a, that's a, that can be a challenge for people to yeah. understand the difference between those. How would you, how would you explain that? It's essential. Yeah, like you brought up a good one, the habit of, of getting a coffee. There's nothing wrong with it. If you find that going out to a coffee uh, shop and grabbing something and interacting with people brings you some measure of joy and you're honest with yourself about that and it really does, then you need to keep doing that. The But the idea of doing something just habitually because that's the way you've always done it, that's what we want to capture. So as you're looking at where you're spending, you could kind of classify like, okay, this is an obligation. We got to have a shelter over our heads. We need to have transportation. We need to have food, clothing. Good. And then you get into other stuff where you think, oh, I just kind of always do that, you know? Um, hmm, I'll think about that one a little harder. <laughs> and as you do that, you just find there are a lot of lots of opportunities where the spending is just a habit. And uh, you can question that a little more deeply and sometimes uncover where money is, you know, going against what you actually care about. Yeah. And, um, and you just, you know, you take care of it. You're not cutting back. You're not being frugal. You're just aligning money with your priorities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and then rule number two, embrace your true expenses. This is kind of about, uh, not just the things that you know, but really being honest with yourself about what could possibly happen. The, uh, you know, the, the, my car insurance or sorry, not the car insurance, the car registration example from yeah. earlier is one example of these, right? Like before YNAB, I'm not sure that we ever actually factored that in the budget. Could we, cause we just assumed it was kind of minutia. It's like, yeah, but it's not always, it's not really that much. So we yeah. can fly with it as it goes along or, you know, even broader than that, uh, uh, car repairs. If you've got an older car, you know, at some point your car is probably going to break down. It's going to, you know, your windshield's going to get cracked or you're going to need to replace the tires or whatever. And if you're not actually embracing the fact that that happens in life, then that will eventually, you know, bite you in the butt. And yeah. that's kind of what this is all about, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I am, I'm amazed at how many people um, are under the assumption that they've purchased tires that will never, never wear out. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> um, but that's kind of what we're doing. You know, yeah. you, you'll look at things and you'll say, oh, okay, I guess, um, based on how I'm allocating my money at the moment, I'm assuming we will never go on vacation. We will never buy birthday presents. We will never buy presents around the holidays. Um, we will never travel. Um, we will never have our car needing repairs and our house will be pristine forever. You know, all, <laughs> all these, these are the implicit assumptions based on our behavior. And so we want to say, oh, we know that's not true. So what, what do we do? And it's a matter, a lot of times you can look back in your bank account and you can say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to visually scan down these, these rows of numbers. And I'm going to look for an extra digit to the left, right? I'm going to see what are the big spending numbers? Like, what is it? What, do I ever get anything that's a thousand? You're like, okay, rent. Okay. I got that one. And then you see like, oh, what was this for 1300? Oh, that was that repair on that thing, you know? And you just review your expenses for as far back as your bank will let you, maybe six months to a year, really quick scan, and you will find you will find these expenses that are recurring but not regular, not frequent enough to be on our radar. And those are the ones we want to capture. You just take those large, less frequent expenses, you break them up into monthly amounts, and you treat them like a monthly bill. So every month, you're paying a little bit for Christmas or you're paying for this holiday, um, you know, this travel, these travel plans, a cruise, whatever it may be. And then, as you mentioned on that road trip, when you go on the road trip, you just go. Your money situation is actually really boring. It's super flat. And that's what we want to see. We want to see the emotion be about the joy of the vacation, not the stress of the money. So when that money just is like, oh, it's here and you just spend, it feels like your expenses are nice and even at this point, even though in actuality, our cash outlays, you know, go like this um, mm -hmm. month to month because, you know, there's no normal month ever. So that's what we want. We want the money nice and boring and stable. And that's what you can do is just embrace the fact that your true expenses are higher than just those monthly obligations that you have. Now, I could also see this being kind of uh, something that would trick up, uh, you know, trick people out um, in setting this up because you could, 
you could almost, to a certain degree, I mean, any, anyone that's setting this up will do it to the level that they feel comfortable with, but you could almost go overboard, right? Like yeah. literally put every single little thing in there and be like, well, I've got a, I've got a budget for chewing gum because I buy, exactly. you know, a couple of packs a month and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But that, that's kind of going too far. I guess it's probably up to the, the user though, how deep they want to go. Right. Yeah. It, it's, um, it's, there's a, a, evolution of a person usually as they get into this. So at first they're like, I want nothing to do with it. Yeah. And then they, they have something happen. They say, Oh yeah, maybe I'll check it out. So they've gone in, they've checked it out and then they get really into it, really into it. And it it's kind of like to a certain degree. Oh yeah. yeah. And they're like, I'm going to, yeah. I'm in this every day. I love my budget. I love moving money around. And I, I, I talk to him about toothpaste. Usually that's always kind of my go-to. I just say, you don't, I know toothpaste lasts probably a year, maybe, I don't know, six months or something. Uh, if you buy it from Costco, it's probably a five-year supply or something like that. So you end up just saying, do you really want to set aside money for toothpaste? The, you don't. <laughs> or when you're at Walmart and they're like, well, this is in groceries. This is, uh, you know, hand sanitizer. Yeah, right. So right. I just say, listen. It's just it's, it's Walmart. Just make a Walmart category and get over time. Unless you're buying everything you can at Walmart and it's a material amount, then you just just let it be. So there's usually an ebb and flow, and people will go really granular because they're kind of enjoying it, and then they'll realize like, oh wait, wait, I'm not really getting any value out of this. I'll back off a little bit. Julie and I have an other category yeah. that is a little bit of a danger zone, you know, where you're like, oh, that's an Amazon purchase, other. You know, and you realize as Amazon tries to become the everything store, really, that everyone's dealing with the same problem, you know, and I, I do sometimes like to do a little bit of an audit when you have a miscellaneous category and other category, make sure you aren't lying to yourself, you know, and saying, oh, wait, we're spending money here and, you know, we're just kind of hidden because we're, we're not really categorizing it uh, closely enough. But I would, for the most part, as far as having people stay on a budget and on a main maintainable level or at a maintainable pace, um, I would much rather have them be less granular where it's mm -hmm. easier and there's less tedium and they're just hitting their big goals. Like they're sending lots of money to pay off debt. They're sending lots of money to their retirement. They're, you know, they're saving up for a house they want to buy. If they're hitting those big goals. Those little things usually don't move the needle too much. Yeah. The other category ours is uh, named stuff I forgot to budget for. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like, it, it's a little bit of a, a dangerous category to even touch. You you don't really know where the items go inside the structure of your budget, so you end up putting it there. It almost always ends up kind of going over a little bit because it's the 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 leave behinds. You know, it's the yeah. The, like, the I don't think I don't think Julie would let it fly if I was like I forgot to budget for a bandsaw. You know, like she'd be like, no, no, I don't think that that's allowed. You know. So yeah, it can be abused, and you got I, if you're sharing finances with the partner, then usually you guys can kind of check each other on that. Uh, you know, hopefully in a you know in an honest and fun way if possible. So one thing that you mentioned in the rule two chapter of this is something that took me a long time to understand, but I totally get it now and I love it is this idea of an emergency fund not being totally necessary anymore. Yeah. We had an emergency fund that was pretty that was doing really well. Of course it was an external account. It wasn't tracked in YNAB, but we were using YNAB wrong. We were using YNAB uh, this month's money to pay for everything that we accumulated last month. So we were using right. YNAB to track things, but yeah. we weren't using t using today's money to pay for, you know, today's charges, essentially. So we were a month exactly. behind, essentially. And yeah. we had to kind of have our, our come to Jesus moment where it was mm -hmm. like, well, we've got this, you know, this, this nice, well-funded external account of emergency savings. What is the difference of taking that into our general fund and bringing it up to current? It's still emergency savings, even though it's not in that external account. It's still extra money that, that has funded certain things. It's just you think about it differently. And that kind of falls yeah. into, into this. Yeah. And it, it's, I can see why you would have been nervous because there's a lot of um, confidence and there's like some emotional yes. surety around, we got this money just in case. A lot of the, the first thing that you mentioned around living on the float, if you're using a credit card for most of your spending and many, many do, uh, and that's fine. But what happens is people end up saying, Hey, I never pay interest on my card. I'm very responsible. And that's good. Um, but they're actually living a month behind. So yeah. when the credit card bill comes due, they can pay it with money they have just earned, but it's for spending that took place prior to them earning that money. 
And we call it the float. You're just living on the credit card float. And it's exactly what the credit card companies want, um, kind and benevolent as they are. They <laughs> want you to just kind of just get moved a little further away in your cycle where you do start to have to carry a little bit of balance, but not too big and things like that. So if you couldn't t take at any moment, um, pay off your balance on your card, then you are living on the float, at least a little bit. So that's kind of for any listeners thinking, well, am I doing that? Just go pay off your credit card bill with what's in your checking account. And if you run out of money in your checking account, then you knew, yeah. <laughs> you don't actually do it, but just compare. Then you'd know, okay, I'm out. You know, I'm not, I'm not right. actually living current. Um, so that's that first bit. That's a good kind of stress test on, on people. The next bit about the emergency fund, and really, as you embrace rule two and you start looking ahead to house repairs um, and lots of the gotchas, not so much the vacations, people rarely would raid an emergency fund to go on vacation, but they would do things for like the unexpected, the, the car tires wearing out, transmission falling out, whatever it is, these repairs that'll happen. Uh, we just had one, you know, where, where our, we'd left a sink running in our laundry room and it, it, luckily we caught it before it went crazy, but you know, we had to meet the deductible on our you know, a homeowner's policy. And that would have normally been an emergency fund situation. What happens is you've been looking ahead so much at what comes and you've been setting aside money for it, making them all into monthly bills that you end up not ever using an actual emergency fund. You use the house repairs right. uh, money for the flood and you use, you know, the car repairs for the new tires. And um, I noticed this in my own finances a little while ago where I just thought we have this fund here and we haven't touched it for years. And it's because rule two is just kind of doing its job. Very few things are actually emergencies where you didn't foresee them. You could have massive medical. That would be one yeah. massive medical, but Absolutely. usually, usually insurance is the catastrophic answer to that. Um, although it's still, it still is a burden. Um, you could have a job loss and an extended job loss. I could see uh, a reason being for having some kind of an emergency fund there, but it can be much more conservative than we're usually told. Um, six months would be, that's a long, uh, long time to go without a job. But, um, that would be, if you feel like, Hey, given my line of work, given my situation, I want more of a safety net, then do it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, to each his own, but you'll just usually notice that, that, uh, budgeting this way fulfills a lot of what the emergency fund was doing for you. Yeah. And I, I know, you know, when, when things come up and you have to draw from it, it kind of ties into rule three where, where it's uh, rule three is roll with the punches. It's easy to think that you've been defeated <laughs> to yeah. a certain degree when you set aside money in one, in a bucket, and then you find that you have to draw from it be, uh, for some other priority that happens to come along. But the reality is uh, you know, you, this is why this is such a powerful system, because you've already set aside this money, you've given it a job. If another priority has to come along and take from that category, essentially you, an emergency fund built within your system, it's not necessarily something to be you know upset about. It's nice that you had it versus not having it at all. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's I, I'm amazed that people are so upset with themselves and they realize they can't foresee the future. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just I think you should be in the stock market. You shouldn't be budgeting at all. Yeah. You should just be, you know, making trades. So we really you want to treat yourself or see yourself more as like a, a coach that, you know, you, you review game film, you study your opponent, you've coached your team, everyone has their jobs, they know exactly what they want to do, they, you probably have a good idea of what the opponent will bring. And then when the game starts, you begin immediately making adjustments. And that is exactly what we do with budgeting. You're playing chess, it's the same way. The guy brings out a pawn, you do that as well. You're, you're, you're always responding to externalities, always responding to how the opponent place. And it's the exact same way with budgeting and life. So when life throws something at you where the tire blows out, that's life. Like you're alive. These things will happen. And so it doesn't mean, oh, I should have known the tire would blow out and put more money there. It just means, okay, now that I know that it has, what am I going to do? You can set aside for eventualities and things, but a lot of the times it's just moving things around a little bit, making sure everything's still okay it's very rarely like these big sweeping changes that come in and knock us off if we're following rule two. So just make adjustments. Don't be upset with yourself if you said you'd spend $650 on groceries and you spent 690 or 750. Just say, oh, okay, why is 750 more realistic? And just kind of learn from it and keep going. Every day you get more information than you had the day before. 
And that information should be incorporated into your plan. Otherwise, you're just... You know, you're just setting something in stone that you'll eventually just bury and never look at anyway. Right. It's easy to trick yourself into thinking it's not going to happen when the data is right there to tell you. Like, you know, gro grocery spend. Food seems to be more expensive nowadays. Yeah. And if month after month you've set a really responsible uh, grocery grocery budget and month after month you continue to go 50 to 60 to $70 over that, then it's time to you know maybe reanalyze and realize it, I'm only fooling myself if I continue yeah. going over and then borrowing from other categories. Reorganize things so that maybe you're taking 20 less from here, 10 less from there, whatever, and you can restructure it so that that money is there. And then you don't have that mental like drag on. Oh yeah, you. I did that for years with groceries. I had this, I just this desire like we're going to spend this much, yes. and then you know I realized my wife one day is like, listen, I don't. My a success for me, what I care about, my priority with grocery spending, and we have a lot of kids, she says, is that we get in and out of the store without a kid melting down <laughs> and that groceries end up in the house. She's yeah. like, that's my goal. That is a 100% success rate. And it had nothing to do with um, cutting at every corner and you know price shopping and coupon clipping. And when she said that to me, very heartfelt, very much like this is my priority, then I just thought, oh, okay. That's that's what matters right. for us with groceries, not you know optimizing every single penny. It was a breakthrough for me. I can't believe it took me like a decade <laughs> to figure it out. You know, but anyway, that's that's just an example Poor of how Julie, you're always yeah. learning on this stuff, right? Exactly. Uh, and then rule number four: age your money. This is another one of those concepts that again took me a long time to really truly understand. But now I now I completely get it. Right? Like once we moved the money over from the emergency fund into the 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 general fund that that YNAB is tracking over time all of those categories get filled for their own individual things and basically the money that exists within the count over time will increase and will get larger as those buckets stay filled and that basically means that you're living more and more off of money you already have or money that's even older instead of money that's negative you know money that you're paying into the past uh, exactly I don't know maybe you have a better way of explaining that, but this one, this was a hard concept for me at first. I was like, it, what, what does 10 days old mean really when yeah, you're talking about your yeah, money? Yeah, it is, it is a little bit new. I mean, or maybe very new. It, it's just a matter of saying, okay, I'm, I'm about to spend a dollar. When did I earn this dollar? Did I earn it yesterday? It's a day old. Did I earn it 10 days ago? It's 10 days old. And that thinking is what we want. We want to say, or on the flip side, when you earn a dollar, you ask yourself, how long will I go before I need this dollar? Right. And that's the keys. You want to be able to go 30 to 60 days. Anything past that's, you know, it's fine. But less than 30 days means you're, you're not yet in this cadence where like you can always answer the obligations with money you have on hand. These monthly obligations that hit, you always have money on hand. But when you start getting 30 plus, get up to 60, you're essentially at the end of, let's say, June, you are already budgeted for completely for July. You could handle any July expenses, and many people could even say, oh, I could handle August as well, right there in the budget. It's just a matter of letting that money sit over time. It's, it's one of the rules you really don't have to do anything for. You just let time pass, keep working the first three rules, yep. and then you realize one day, man, this money that I earned, I won't need this for 60 days. It's a strange and welcome feeling for most people. And that ends up being, you know, a big reason why why you were saying earlier that emergency fund is not necessary. Someone in the chat was was wondering his is his advice don't have an emergency fund. And I just want to clarify uh, to you, faux pas. No, that was not the advice. If if the emergency fund makes sense for you as as an added bonus or in any general sense, I think go for it. But the idea behind this is as you age your money, that means that you have more money sitting in there for all these things. If you were to suddenly find yourself out of a job and you need to cover three months worth of essential, uh, you know, uh, things, obligations, whatever they happen to be, your money is sitting in these categories still, and it can be routed in those ways to cover for those things. So you do have an emergency fund. It's just existing within this plan as opposed to a big general pool. Outside. And when you do elect to have an emergency fund, and they may then just make sure that this the it's specifically said what this is for. This is for job loss. 
this is for a catastrophic event, you know, and, and list them and then make sure that you're clear that that's what this money is for and nothing else. Because a lot of the times what we'll end up doing is we're, we're doing it for things that are regular events like car repairs or home repairs. They're just, we don't know when they happen, but we know they will. And that's not what an emergency fund really is for. Emergency fund should be seen as a catastrophic situation where the money is there to help you, you know, weather that catastrophe. Yeah. We're nearing the end of this interview, which is so sad for me because I have so many questions for you, which is always the case when I bring on awesome people onto this show. I have far too many questions and not enough time to ask them. couple that I want to get in there real quick before we end things off. Uh, like and, a lightning round. Yes. Okay. A lightning round. I'll try and be really brief. Okay. <laughs> I got it. All right. Fresh start. You recommend that starting fresh with a budget every once to two years is a good thing. It's really intimidating once you've built up your budget to a certain point. You think everything's essential. How could I possibly possibly restructure this. Uh, I mean, what, what is your advice there? It, it really just helps you um, look back and question everything. So we have all sorts of assumptions that build up over time, even if we're budgeting really well. So when you fresh start, you get a big pile of money that you've accumulated through prior really good budgeting. Yeah. And now you just kind of say, what does this money need to do before I'm paid again? And you have a big pile. And so you start to be able to question assumptions that are maybe core. Should we live here? Should we have these cars? Should, you know, big, big things. So I think that fresh start allows you to just have an exercise where you, and if you're sharing finances with a partner, you and your partner question everything. It gets really good thinking and gets really good life planning happening. I love doing it. Yeah, man, it's still so intimidating, but I think Very we're going to have to do it. It's, it's been a couple of years and we built it up to a point uh, and it would probably be a good thing to do. Credit cards, obviously credit cards aren't necessarily a no-no. Um, and you you guys have made a lot of improvements on how credit cards kind of are visualized within the software. It used to be kind of confusing yeah. to know that that actually meant that's what you owed and now it's pretty obvious. Um, but it's all worked within the same budget. What What is a good use of a credit card within the YNAB system versus a bad use, would you say? Uh, if the credit card has any kind of balance on it, it shouldn't be used. It, you know, you got to take care. It's too expensive to purchase things like that. Um, but if you find that the credit card um, gets you points, and you do not carry any kind of balance on it, there's zero finance charges, you come out ahead, it would be okay. Be careful though, because a lot of the times people still will justify credit card spending because of these points. And I, people will say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the wool over the eyes of Chase, you know, or whatever. These banks know exactly, exactly what they're doing. They are winning. They, I think we just had earnings statements from lots of the banks, maybe yesterday, day before. They are winning. Like they are so unbelievably profitable. So never think you are winning in this situation. <laughs> just know <laughs> they've got my data. They they um, they know everything I spend my money on. Like there are, are very um, compelling reasons for them to have you use the card even if you never pay them interest. So just know that going in, eyes wide open, and then, uh, yeah, enjoy your points, that I is, guess. That is a <laughs> fascinating answer. I'm not sure I expected that, but it makes a whole lot of sense. You have a, a pretty large family, right? You've got four kids. Yeah. We have uh, six kids. Six kids. But there are four that I like, so that makes sense. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, do your kids use YNAB? If so, at what point did you kind of bring them into the fold and, and teach them, and how did you use it? When they turn eight, we, we move them in like religiously eight years old is a big deal for us. And so that was kind of a nice time for me to just say, Hey, you turned eight and we do this. Let's also get you budgeting. So, uh, they get their own YNAB budget and, um, they work uh, for YNAB. They clean the office. They're actually here right now. Smart. Um, Smart. hopefully cleaning. They're not the best employees, but hopefully they, they learn over time. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, they earn some money. And then usually every other Sunday I'll sit down with them and kind of show them how it works. We, you know, we allocate to a few categories. It's a ton of fun. Kids have no preconceived notions about how bad budgeting is. All they see is this is what I want and this is how soon I can get it. Yep. I like this. You know, it's pretty fun to watch. That's awesome. We do, we do manage uh, for both our kids. I have a five and an eight year old. We manage their sections of our budget Perfect. to track yeah. spending, savings and giving. And mm -hmm. all that happens on an automatic monthly basis. We'll kind of show it to them. Our five year old, you know, she couldn't care less. It's just, okay, I want to yeah. buy, you know, whatever the toy is that she wants on any given day. Uh, but our eight-year-old is starting to really get it and be like, well, wait a minute. If I just let this accumulate, I can do that. It's super power empowering. Um, 
what, what uh, what's next? What what do you have in the horizon? Obviously, that's kind of a hard question to answer because uh, yeah. you, you probably want to keep some secrets and everything like that. But you've got an awesome book. Your service is doing really well. Obviously, uh, what what is, what are some things on your wish list? We, um, I mean, you mentioned this early on, like it takes a while to really get the, get a grip on things, um, have these light bulb moments for using yeah. YNAB. So we are just obsessively focused on trying to make that learning curve that you fought through and that thousands fight through. We would like to make that less steep. So we are focused heavily on that. I'm also really intrigued uh, to see what we're doing with the API. So we've got an API contest going right now. Lots of cool integrations happening awesome. and, uh, It'll be fun to see, you know, if people will start using like a smart Philips bulb to glow red if they go over in a, you know, spending category or something <laughs> like that. So it'll be it'll be fun to watch what kind of happens. But I think that API will allow us to bring more awareness to people, you know, as they maybe as they visit Amazon.com, you know, it pops up what's in their books category immediately and just things like that that are small and we wouldn't want to roll out across, you know, the entire user base. But people can kind of pick and choose all the cart what will help them be more aware and have their money being lined up with what they really care about. I'm not sure this is the right time and place to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. I got two feature requests for you. Okay, two let's things do it. that I would love. One, recurring yearly goals. So, for example, using the uh, okay. the you know car registration. I know that in January, on January 15th, every year, my car registration is going to be X amount of dollars. But right now, I can only set a yearly goal. Fund this yeah. by this date. And then when it's and done, it goes, it. it goes away. I got to yeah. reset it. Give me a checkbox so that I can make that a recurring uh, yearly goal. That would be awesome. That is on a shorter list than most feature requests land on. So I'm, I like that you requested that one. Sometimes people will give me a request and I just think, oh, boy. That's, I don't know. Yeah. But that one actually I can I can speak to that. Goals are due for an overhaul and that recurring thing is one that we've looked at. Uh, that that just seems so obvious. Awesome. Know. Awesome. Uh, this this next one might actually be in the latter category. My <laughs> wife brought it up to me this morning and though it sounds really interesting and super useful if you have a mortgage, I'm not sure how wide, you know, it it applies, but it would it would kind of fit into the YNAB philosophy. Um, she was talking about insight tools into mortgage pay down. The idea being that if you have a mortgage that you're paying to, there's a certain amount that goes to principal and a certain amount that goes to interest. Having some way, and I'm not sure how you visualize this, this is why it's kind of challenging, um, to understand as you know a YNABber, uh, if I decide to put X amount of dollars more into this category, what does that do for the lifetime of the mortgage? Right. When, how much sooner does it get paid off? Kind of getting some sort of visual sense or mental sense around the power of applying more of your residual funds within your budget yeah. to these things to save you in the long run we have we have a um, we would like to handle debt in the broader sense where people want to pay down debt faster yeah. they want to snowball it or whatever we would like to be able to handle that more in the app and give more insight as to how important it is to get that stuff you know gotten rid of so that you can just use all the money that you earn to do what you want. So I think debt handling and mortgage would fit right in with that. It just has another one of those debts. Yeah, yeah. That's that's on, uh, it's it's one of those where we, we always just think when we finally do this, it's gonna be great. And I feel like we're finally getting traction inside the company to get that some momentum. So cool. I'm actually, yeah, I don't think, I, I don't think either of your requests landed in the, uh, in like that filing cabinet I have right behind me. So. <laughs> or the paper shredder right next to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jesse, this has been awesome. I've, I've been looking forward to this interview for a, a long time since I reached out to you. I'm super happy that you, uh, that you were willing to jump on and talk to me about your book. It is called You Need a Budget. Makes a whole lot of sense. That stands, uh, YNAB stands for You Need a Budget. If you go to YNAB.com, you can go to the online version. It's a cloud-managed software for this philosophy, for setting up your budget. You guys have a 34-day uh, free trial, and that's 34 days so that you get through the month, and then you have a few extra days to kind of, you know, see it, see the afterglow of that, so to speak. Takes a little bit of work up front, uh, but it's, it's worth checking out just to kind of get a sense for the system. But like you said the book is is all about theory and philosophy and it doesn't necessarily require the software itself uh but personally as a user i'm a big fan of the software so i highly recommend it uh did i miss anything jesse i think this is pretty think comprehensive that was, i couldn't have sold it better on my own so thank you very much that was awesome <laughs> jesse meekum author of the book and founder of winab really appreciate you taking time uh to talk with me today thank you and best of luck with winab and we'll be in touch thank you thanks for taking the time you bet
Happily, gladly. Uh, this has been another episode of Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell. If you want to find the show on our site, you can do that easily. It's twit.tv slash TRI or twit.tv slash triangulation. That's going to take you to the show page where all the episodes that we've recorded in the past, all the amazing people that we've chatted with uh, are listed there. And there are quite a few. I think this is episode 355-ish right around there. So you've got a lot of catching up to do. Uh, if you want to catch us live, we usually record live every Friday around 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 2200 UTC. This was recorded a little bit earlier in the day. So if you're tuning in later, you, you'll see this on the rerun. Uh, but regardless... We're here Friday with a new episode each and every week, and it's my honor to uh, get the chance to do this as well. And thank you to produce our producer, uh, Karsten, who's pushing the buttons and making all these bookings happen and everything. It's just so much fun to be involved with it. Uh, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on another episode of Triangulation. Bye, everybody. <laughs>